country. We've been dealing with other things today. Far too many young couples find it hard to own their own homes. On the things that matter to people. It's irresponsible and it's wrong and they should... We have to make sure that we focus jobs and living standards and the National Health Service and schools. People worry about disrespect on the street. I've always believed... The British people... Well, hello everyone. I'm back after I had to stop the Stuart Lee thing. I was attacked by the metropolitan liberal elite. That's who attacked me. They forced me to take that stream down. And now I'm here. Now I'm here. So uh, we're going to be carrying on uh, watching the 1994, sorry, the 1997 uh, election although i'm i'm kind of interested that uh blair appeared on um on sophie ridge today on uh yesterday i wonder what he said on sophie ridge did anybody watch that interview uh i know a lot of people send me blair stuff on the regular uh let's see what blair said on ridge uh There's there's a whole interview here. Should we do? Do we want to have a look at Ridge, or shall we uh, just go back to the ninety seven election? Kind of interested in uh, watching a bit of uh, watching a bit of Ridge, to be honest. Want to watch a bit of Ridge, or should we just go straight to night like, back to ninety seven? Let's do some Ridge. Come on, let's do some Ridge. Okay. Hopefully you can all see this. Let's make a start. I just want to start off with domestic politics, if I may. How worried are you about the state of the economy? Uh, very. There's Tone. Looking uh, dark as ever. <laughs> now looking kind of, uh, he's become, <laughs> no longer is he dark, Lord. He's become uh, Sir Tony the White. Sir Tony the White. Um, I will just remind people, by the way, that uh, I have activated... The, I was going to do the Jordan Peterson thing tonight, um, but I changed my mind and did the Stuart Lee thing. Ill-fated though it was, uh, I hope you enjoyed the hour that I was able to do. Um, but uh, remember, promo code... Merit, pure merit, such... Will get you 25% off until such time as I do that Jordan Peterson stream, which is probably going to be tomorrow afternoon at this point. Not going to promise anything. It'll probably be tomorrow afternoon. All right, let's get going. If you look at the figures, um, our growth and productivity rates are, have been very poor over these last years. We're spending more than, well, probably, I don't know, since the 1940s, taxing more, um, and the outcomes are poor. If you look at the health service, criminal justice. You know, so, no, it's, it's a very difficult situation now. Lots of other countries have, have similar problems, but I think ours are, are, are worse. Do you think people... Were so, we're in the shit, says Tone. And here's the thing. Who can actually disagree with him? Who can, who can possibly disagree with him? Um, by the way, if anybody sent Super Chats in that last stream, I will, I will, I will do them in this stream later on. Um, in the interest of... I, I've, I've spotted a couple of Super Chats were sent in that last stream i'll i'll deal with them this stream um so yeah uh yeah i'll i'll deal with those soon okay realize how bad and difficult things could be in the years ahead with mortgages with cuts potentially i think people realize how bad it is and you know to be fair i think the politicians realize how bad it is the question is what you do about it and you know in our conference this this coming week what we want to do is focus both on what you might do there's a conference oh man there's a conference i wonder if they're going to be airing it in the short term by short term i mean over one parliament and then the longer term question which i think is all about the technology revolution I'm really keen to talk about those points first, um, but just on the economy, Labour, of course, need to prove, as always, to voters that they can be trusted on the economy. And Why does Sophie Ridge look like she's about 25 or something? So Sophie Ridge is probably older than me, but she looks about 25. 
Gordon Brown famously said he would stick to the Conservatives' spending plans for the first two years in 97. Do you think it would be sensible for Rachel Reeves to do similar? Well, I think Rachel will make her, her judgment on that. But I think what she has done in the last few years is really restore Labour's economic credibility. And that's incredibly important. And the truth of the matter is that it's going to be a very difficult situation for Labour coming in. And that's, that's the challenge. The, the challenge is, unlike in 1997, I mean, in 1997, notice, by the way, that he just takes it as read that Labour are going to come in and be the next government. You know, remember that the, the, um, the article I wrote about Tony Blair and Manifest Destiny, Tony Blair and the politics of divine, like the divine right of liberalism. Blair has seen the future. Blair already knows um, that um, it's going to be... Uh, Starmer government and he's now talking as if it's basically set in stone that Labour are going to be the next government. Um, that's kind of interesting, very interesting. Um, I will note by the way that Sophie Ridge is two years younger than me, so she is actually, but she she looks like she's about 24, not 38. It was obvious the country needed a big programme of social and liberal change. We had, I think, only 10% of the MPs were women, you know, gay people didn't have equality, uh, there'd be no black cabinet minister, we didn't have a mayor of London, we didn't have devolved a, a, a parliament or assembly, there was no peace process in Northern Ireland, no minimum wage. Okay, but, we get it, we right. get it. <laughs> but the point is, there was lots for us to do. <laughs> be careful, Sophie, you never shut the Dark Lord down. Be careful, Sophie. That if you like, were, were things that didn't cost money to do. Well, you had money though as well, didn't you? Let's be honest. You had growth. You had uh, debt levels were, I think, 37% in 97, now well over 100. And right. So the economy, having gone through a difficult patch, to be fair to John Major and Ken Clark, the thing was much more stabilised. So we had to keep the economy going. And you spent money. You, you, know, you increased education spending by 83%, health spending more than doubled yeah, in real time. terms. Yeah, yeah, we did over time. Exactly. So, so our task was to rebuild the public realm and keep the economy moving along properly. And, you know, we made significant economic changes too, but the point I'm making is exactly the one you're, you're implying, which is it was a lot easier for us. Labour's coming into this time into a much, much more difficult situation where everything is constrained. And therefore the question is, it's, it's not just what do you do? I think it's what do you do to offer hope to people? Because otherwise people think, okay, it's grim and maybe we should put the Conservatives so are we saying that even even Tony Blair agrees with me in Prophets of Doom that things are going down the shitter? Because it's very interesting. Um, Prophets of Doom isn't out uh, yet, yet, but it's available on pre-order on Amazon. Lots of you have bought it already, I know. Um, Prophets of Doom starts with a quotation by Blair from... Um, um, it starts with a quotation from Blair from 2005, talking about basically the, the inevitability of progress and so on. And it's very interesting to hear him now basically admitting that things have got so much worse uh, since the time that he was in power. A um, little crack in the, in the progressive narrative. Uh, although, obviously, he is saying that for political purposes too, because they can uh, pin the decline on the Tories. Um, and the thing is, is that a lot of that is true as well. That's the problem. The Tories have been, I would say, a uniquely awful government since 2010. Uniquely awful. Um, there is literally no redeeming feature that the Tories have, as far as I can tell. Um, they have been fucking woeful. So, I mean... I don't know. I want to see them destroyed. I, I hope Tone helps completely destroy the Tory party. Um, I actually believe we'd be better off in a one party left wing state where the pretense that there's any opposition whatsoever is dropped. That would be more honest because then they'd have to own the mess completely. Um, you wouldn't have this situation where you get this false opposition of jobbers and useless scoundrels like Matt Hancock and 
you know, bloody, what's his name? Zena Madabi or whatever his name is. And uh, Tsunak and all of these totally useless suits that occupy space that pretend basically to be opposed to anything. Um, we will be better structurally if they were gone. It will be better if Tone got to be the Palpatine, the all-powerful, um, than having this situation where we have to put up with a pretense that there's a group of people on our side who aren't. And, and that, if you go back and look last week on uh, Unpopular Opinions, when we, we went, it, I think the stream is called Can the Tories Get Any Worse? And you tell me if the Tories, I mean, I read the Tony Blair Institute website all the time. There is nothing on the Tony Blair Institute as egregiously and aggressively kind of hateful of the British people as that William Hay article that I read on Unpopular Opinions and the Brandon Lewis article that I read on Unpopular Opinions. The Tories, in my opinion, are by far the most rotten of all of the institutions. And as soon as they are destroyed, it will actually give us a fighting chance because the pretense that there's anything else will be gone and people then will truly see the regime for what it is. But it's out, but what is Labour going to do for us when it comes in? And this is where I think the big challenge is, but I think it's a challenge that Labour can meet. I and mean, I guess my big question is what does a Labour government or a progressive government look like if there's no money left? What, what, what does that look like? Yeah, so I think there are, we've identified four things we think you could do over one parliament. Leave aside all the technology stuff, which is longer term, but some of it could be done immediately. But the four things you could do immediately that would help, you could reform our planning system, which is a huge problem, by the way, means there is no possibility of this country meeting its climate change targets at the moment. I mean, absolutely zero possibility. Okay, so reforming the planning system would be a big economic boost. So basically, local concerns... And yeah, you, you're going to have to take a decision. If these national infrastructure projects matter, and remember, we're as a country, even with a conservative government, saying we're going to more than double electricity within a decade. You know, it's, we, we will go through some of the figures next week and just show people the gap between what we've promised and the reality is massive. So there's planning. Um, you see, the realism is good. The realism is good. The cold, hard hand of reality. Tone just saying it's just not possible. This stuff is bollocks that you're that you're promising. And he's right about that. And he knows that he's right. Um, and I, I actually think that this is this is inevitable, by the way, that uh, the regime has to face up to things that just aren't possible. Sooner or later, if it's going to survive. And that, that's one of the reasons that Tone is here pointing this out, because they're just not going to do the net zero. The net zero, I've said it before, is impossible. By 2030, impossible. Then you've got uh, changes in the investment rules, which we've set out recently as to how you get much more money flowing from our pension funds into investment in British infrastructure and British companies. You've got to deal with the labour shortage problem, and then you've got to fix the Brexit relationship. So, you know, those are four things that would take you some time to do, but would, I think, have an immediate impact on growth. But the big question for the future is technology. And you've got some ideas on that as well, um, particularly on the health service, I was quite interested to see. You have some ideas about technology, don't you, Mr Blair, <laughs> to Sir, Sir Tony? Do I have some ideas for you? And the, his eyes are going to light up in a second. Do I have some ideas? <laughs> Yeah, the, it, if, if you look at healthcare today, it's, it's going to undergo a complete revolution. You're going to be able to diagnose diseases and conditions much earlier. In fact, actually, you better do a lot of it from birth through, through um, genetics. You're going to be in a situation where people can manage their own conditions. You know, we all got used to testing uh, during COVID testing ourselves, but actually there's going to be a lot more that you can do. AI is going to transform things like... 
just low low key advocating genetic uh, eugenics there. <laughs> Basically, if I heard him correctly, he was just low key kind of advocating straight up eugenics <laughs> at, at the start of the answer. <laughs> Which uh, you know you can make. Uh, I I have nothing against eugenics myself, but you may you may have your own moral scruples, as you know I don't have any of those. So you know, radiology. I mean, a whole lot of processes within healthcare. Uh, can be digitized. And then AI is also going to mean that you, you're going to develop many more cures and treatments than we have now. So you, you've got the, the whole question about healthcare is how do you reimagine it so that it operates on a completely different basis? So you switch from treating illness, which is why the health service was, was created, to, to prevention and well being. We often you know, talk about the NHS and quite a how can we use genetic engineering to just stop people getting ill, period? <laughs> it's kind of the way he's, kind of where he's going with this line of thought. Sort of starry-eyed way, if you like. Do, do you think that actually it is providing a good standard of care, if you look at international comparisons? Uh, no, at the moment it's, I mean, in some respects it is. Obviously, the staff do a great job in difficult circumstances. And I think the general experience of people is if it's, if you're in, really acute difficulty, uh, then, it, then it still does provide very good care. But a lot of the you know, waiting lists are, are terrible. Um, COVID, of course, has made it all worse. No, we... Can, can I just say, by the way, for the Corbyn, the left of the Labour Party, the NHS is a sacred cow, right? The Tories, while they've been in power, because they just care about what the left say, um, you know, all it takes for the left to do is to say, oh, the Tories, you want to destroy the NHS. And they were like, no, no, we don't. Uh, here's another 800 million billion pounds to show that we Tories are really into the NHS. Um, whereas Tone is, you know, in the space of a few minutes, is literally just laying it in saying, yeah, the NHS is shit, basically. And if we don't, if we don't restructure it, if we don't completely rethink how it works, we're not going to have an NHS. That's the reality of it. He is the one figure in British politics who is just willing to just come out and say this. Um, this is the advantage of being a pragmatist. We, we've, but the truth is, you're not going to have a lot more money to spend. But you do have to think, how do we do things completely differently? I mean, doing things completely differently, that's a big task for the NHS. Do you think there should be more private sector involvement? Well, there should just be a... There should be a, a complete cooperation between public and private sector in two respects. Obviously, the private-public partnership. Obviously, you can use capacity that's in the, the private sector, as, as it did we did when we were in power. But I think there's another thing that's going to be really relevant. A lot of these innovations, particularly innovations that, you know, like the wearables, okay, that, that people have and, the, and your ability to offer probably you know, what, what you might call low complexity but high volume things, a lot of it can be offered through the private sector. And what so it shouldn't be a dirty word then? No, of course not. Because, you know, the, the problem always with the public sector, and this is... Look, at, look how soft this Sophie Ridge interview is, by the way. If there was a Tory sitting there saying that, Ridge would be like, you know, she wouldn't have just given him an easy out like that. She would have been like, oh... You know, are you saying that the government wants to privatise the NHS or whatever it is? They just would never have been able to get away with saying what he just said just now. Um, but it's inevitable, basically, because Tone has said it's inevitable. That means it's definitely going to happen. This is what I learned in government, is the tough thing is to get it to innovate. OK, because in the private sector, if you don't innovate, you go out of business. But it doesn't happen in the public sector. So the question is... Do you think the NHS would have got out of business by now? Well, the, the NHS is a great institution in its principles, and we should keep those principles. But the truth, I mean, you don't have to be a, you know, a genius to look at it and say it's not, it's not serving its purpose. And by the way, the numbers of people we've employed in the health service has risen, not fallen. Um, what about um, you also talking about um, AI and the challenges of AI more widely as well? It often feels to people like AI can be a bit of a scary thing. Do you think we should be embracing it more? Um, well, you know, I asked someone who's an expert in this the other day, and I'm not, but I said to me, so 
is it good or is it bad? And he said, it's good and bad. He said, it's like any general purpose technology. It's, it's like fire or, you know, nuclear power. You can use it for good, you can use it for bad. But the, it's a fact. And, and here's the thing that I think is really important for politics, because, you know, I spent a long time in politics. I have 10 years prime minister. So I'm reasonably experienced in politics. But this is what happens to me when I talk to a lot of politicians, not just here, anywhere, about technology. And they say... Notice what Blair didn't say, by the way. He said, oh, I asked an expert about this the other day, and no, I'm not one. What he didn't say was, actually, a couple of weeks back, uh, I was at Chatham House talking with the uh, the president of Microsoft about what the agenda on AI should be um, and how we can sell this to politicians. He didn't say that. Obviously, we know that because we track his every move on this channel, but he didn't he didn't make that clear to Sophie Ridge, did he? Yeah, it's really interesting. And now let's get back to talk about politics. And I'm saying to them, no, because you've got to understand, this is the equivalent of the 19th century Industrial Revolution. It's going to change everything. It's not something that you think about at the end of the day when you've done your... See, if Sophie Ridge was an actual journalist worth her salt. She wouldn't have just laid that up and be sitting there with her lips puckered up saying, you know, do you want to have a shag later tone? She'd have been like, Blair, you know, Sir Tony Blair, uh, as you said at Chatham House a couple of weeks back in an elite meeting that took place with the president of Microsoft, you're planning a global governance structure around AI, aren't you, Sir Tony? But that is not how this question has come about. This, this is like, oh, um, you know, I, I talked to an expert the other day and here are just some thoughts I may have. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Brilliant. Brilliant fucking. Brilliant journalism. That's why, that's why you were in the big book, Sophie. Fucking hell. Your proper day job in politics this is the mission and for people on the progressive side of politics it is the mission it's the only way you're going to reignite optimism transform the state make it work more effectively and more cost effectively and here's the other piece of good news for britain in this technology space we have real advantages big advantages and we've got to preserve them and 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 and, and you know develop them but it's not just the answer to how you reimagine how the state operates it's also this is the future for the British economy. At the beginning of the section, when we we're talking about what the conference was about, things that a new government could do, you mentioned Brexit. And some people would say, look, part of the reason, not the whole reason, but part of the reason that our economy is doing badly is because of the knock-on causes of Brexit. Do you think a Labour government should pursue a closer relationship with the EU, given that Keir Starmer's ruled out rejoining the single market and the customs union? Yes, I, I, I do. So you, you've got... Rejoining, which I think is very difficult. Um, rejoining the EU, you're talking yeah, about. Yeah, rejoining the EU. What's that slight echo that's come on his voice? Uh... And the reason it's very difficult is that we've spent seven years completely diverted in government from dealing with a lot of the big issues. By, by the way, my uh, cigar stream, the, the Stuart Lee one, has come down, apparently. The BBC have taken it down. Um, what I'm going to have to do... I'm going to have to have a go at redoing that myself without an audience. Um, and, uh, you know, if I've got time, I will then premiere it. And or I'll or maybe I'll try to upload the, the stream from earlier and uh, run it through the copyright checks, you know, in in the quote unquote legal way. And that, you you know, that you usually sort it out. But uh, yeah as we've had to deal with Brexit. I think, I mean, I would love it if it never happened, obviously, mm -hmm. you, you, you know that, but I think if you were to go back into a, a negotiation... If, if you want to watch the Stuart Lee stream, I believe it went out on Twitter, in which case um, you can uh, you can watch it on Twitter. Uh, there. There you go. It's on Twitter. I'll leave the, I'll leave the, the link there. But um, yeah, we'll see. I've, I've had to take it down.
because of um, the BBC has blocked it on copyright, basically. Uh, so I will try to re-upload it later on and uh, and see. Maybe the BBC just aren't going to allow that to be up. Um, I'd be surprised, though, because every single one of those clips is already on YouTube that I played. So that usually means you can clear copyright, but uh, not on a live stream. There's different rules for videos and live streams on, on YouTube uh, for reasons I do not understand. Actually go fully back into you at this, at this moment in time, a future generation, you know, it's another matter, but I think it would be a huge diversion for the, the, the government. But the second thing is, I think this country is only going to be ready to rejoin when it's strong. Mm. You, you don't want to go back into the European Union on, on your knees. There are, there are other things you could do, though. How no, about absolutely. The so I was going to, it, recently, we published a paper that set out a whole lot of things to give us a closer relationship with Europe, including aligning with the regulatory framework in, in, in Europe in areas where British business wants us to do so. Basically cancelling Brexit. And then in cooperating in other big areas around energy but we and have climate. To, we have to be real, right? You, you said that right now we're in a weak position. Why would uh, the EU give us a deal where we can just cherry pick the best bits? Surely they're going to say, OK, if you want to rejoin the customs union, that means X. If you want to rejoin effectively the single market, you're going to have to accept more immigration from the EU, more payments into the budget. Do we so, need to be real about that? Yeah, absolutely. And it's a very good point. So you're going to have to put this together with a whole set, set of things where we're also doing things that Europe's going to find attractive. And what do you think we should be willing to compromise on there then? Well, I don't think it's, it's so much a matter of compromising and saying where are the areas that, that Europe's going to want us to work with them. And there you can see a, a lot of them, for example, science, which is one of the reasons why it's so important that we rejoin this Horizon programme. There are things that we can do with Europe and for Europe that, that will help. Also, Europe itself, I think, you know, it also recognises now that the loss of Britain is a, is a problem for Europe, and, and it is. And when you look at this technology space, the absence of Britain from the room where Europe will decide its regulatory policy for artificial intelligence would you, would you, is a problem. Would you accept free movement of people? Um, well, you're not going to go back to do that unless you go back into the, the single market. This is one of the softest interviews I've ever seen, by the way. It's just it's ridiculous how softball the interview is. But I do think for labour shortages in certain areas, we should be making it much easier for Europeans to come here and to work here. Um, I'm interested to get your thoughts on Ukraine, uh, if I may as well, because I know that you're interested in international stuff as well, of course. What do you think the end game in Ukraine looks like? Well, it's a difficult question, I know. Yeah, yeah, it's... So I think there are, <clears throat> there are two... I'm almost sorry for asking, Tone. It's a difficult question, but if you'd just be so kind to, you know, share your wisdom on it. Issues. The first is what is Ukraine's relationship with the West, NATO membership, European Union membership. And the second question is what do you do about territory? And I think it's you know, extremely difficult to see how you get a solution to this unless it's very clear that Ukraine has a clear path to European Union membership and a clear path to NATO membership. And I think probably people will wait and see what happens out of this Ukrainian counteroffensive. Um, and, you know, I mean, I, I read that they'd already lost a fifth of all of their, their equipment, to, you know, 20% of their tanks already. In that counteroffensive, that's what I read. Um, the Ukrainians have done an extraordinary job in defending their country, and by the way, defending us by defending their country. But I think it will be how you 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 deal with. Look at look at that lambda saying this is exactly this is exactly how I would ask player questions. If I I would be a much tougher interviewer. I'd be Jeremy Paxman like in my laser like focus. Uh, wouldn't let him squirm off like Sophie. I mean, Sophie Ridge is basically giving him the interview equivalent of a noshing here. I mean, I, I think she may actually be in love with him. The way the way she's interviewed him over the past 30 minutes has been frankly embarrassing. Those two issues together, and it's uh, this is going to be extremely difficult, but I do think once we take stock after the counteroffensive, we've got to see if there is a way to bring it to an end 
with a negotiated end to it. And do you think territory may have to come into that? Well, I think territory is going to be the most difficult thing because Ukrainians will never accept that the territory that, I mean, from an international community point of view has been taken wrongly from them should be left with, with Russia. So this is going to be the most difficult thing for sure. This US election next year, Donald Trump looks the most likely candidate for the Republicans. We know what his view is on Ukraine. You can very much see him pulling American support. Um, do you th are you worried that the US backing for Ukraine may start to dry up next year? I mean, I hope, I mean, I don't know, but I hope that a Trump presidency would not mean that, even if that were to happen. Note that he doesn't rule out a Trump presidency. Because it would be completely disastrous if America withdrew its support from Ukraine. And I think the way that President Biden has managed to marshal support for Ukraine and keep people pretty much on the same page has been you know, a significant act of statesmanship. So I, I, no, I hope that's not the case. But, but because let's be clear, I think the other thing just to say this to you about Ukraine, I think the most important thing talking to Ukrainians and my institutes had a project in Ukraine for many years they want an end to this, which is on terms that make it clear that no Russian president, not this one or any successive one, can ever come back and do this again. And I think that will be the overwhelming desire in Eastern Europe as well. So for that to happen... That's not going to happen though, is it, Blair? He's off his tree when it comes to this situation. I, I think the regime is really desperate on, on Ukraine. I, I think this is just delusional talk from uh, the neocon establishment. I mean, this is one area where uh, I do not agree with Blair on, by the way, is uh, his kind of undying, hardcore neoconnery, basically. It's just not going to happen. Not without America committing troops on the ground is that outcome going to happen that American support has to be firm. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Now I want to finish with a question that I think might make you roll your eyes, okay? Um, but I don't know what your thoughts on it, so I'm, I'm quite interested to know. Okay. Um, Hugh Edwards, what's your take on how that story's been handled? Well, I, I'm not going to roll my eyes, but I don't... I honestly don't know the... I don't, I don't think anyone knows the facts. And I feel sorry for everyone involved. You know, these are very... very you know, human situations and, and you know, obviously like, like you, I've known him for, for many years. I, I, I don't really have any great insight. Yeah. I'm sorry, but I just, I hope. Yeah. <laughs> what a bit, look at what this is literally. What, what is this? <laughs> Let's watch that again. Finish with a question that I think might make you roll your eyes. But it's a I don't, pathetic reaction. I honestly don't know the, I don't, I don't think anyone knows the facts. And I feel sorry for everyone involved. You know, these are very, very you know, human situations. And, and, you know, obviously, like, like you, I've known him for, for many years. I, I, I don't really have any great insight. Yeah. I'm sorry. But yeah. I, just, I hope it Lovely. all gets resolved Fucking in hell. a way that, you know, keeps people, keeps people in good health and, and resolves whatever issues that have happened. But I don't really... I'm not an expert on this. I, I understand. Um, I guess... It's like a scene from Bloody Love Actually or something, this interview. I guess there are sort of wider questions about the BBC, and there's kind of two perspectives here. One is that the BBC is effectively stumbling from crisis to crisis, and the other is that actually there are other institutions who have got the BBC in their sights. They're kind of gunning for the BBC, if you like. And I just wonder, what's your view here on the BBC? So my, my view on the BBC is... And I've had my run-ins with the BBC. As, yeah, as, we know. Yeah, well documented. Um, but I think it's a great... Yeah, because they, I mean, even the BBC don't give sycophantic interviews on this level, eh, So, <laughs> British institution. And I, I mean, of course, these things will happen from time to time, but I don't think it means that the whole of the BBC is now a bad institution. And I think, you know, frankly, the BBC should... You, you know, they say, like, power is an aphrodisiac. Is that what's happening in this interview? Because I've never seen anything like this. She is just outrageous in this interview. Stand up for itself a bit more, to be, to be blunt about it. And also, by the way, abroad, the BBC is still regarded as an important British institution. And given our need to make sure we keep as much of our position of power in the world as we can, you know, I'm 
So whatever my you know, disagreements from time to time, no, I'm, I still basically support it. Um, and then just finally, I think it's 16 years since you were Prime Minister, and whenever I interview you, there is some burning political issue that you want to talk about, whether it's testing during COVID now, whether it's the impact that artificial intelligence is going to have on the UK and the world as well. Do you find it a bit hard to let go? <laughs> it's not, I mean, I've had to let go. I mean, but, but it's... No, You're not I'm chillaxing not. in the shepherd's hut though, right? No, no, that's never going to be me. So it, it's, but I'm fascinated. <laughs> no, I am never going to retire. <laughs> by the world and the single thing that is in a way most um, strange and almost a little at times it's a bit shocking is how much I've learned since leaving office it's a fascinating world out there and if I've any so I say this to any young people I meet in Britain today, yeah did she actually say to Blair chillaxing in an actual interview with Blair she said you're not chillaxing <laughs> you're not chillaxing in a shit <laughs> oh man they go and learn about the world because the biggest risk for a country like britain especially given our history is that we you know we, we become insular we don't understand how fast the world is changing and how absolutely vital it is to understand those changes because if you can't understand them you can't make them work for you given you've learned so much since you've left office if you could go back and change one thing that you did what would you what would you do? there'd be a lot there'd be a list <laughs> but but I'm best to leave that to others to speculate on. Okay, thank you very much. Thanks, Sophie. Oh, I wonder what his list is. I'd love to see his list. I'd love to see the list of things that he would change. That's what I want to... That's, uh, all right. My God, that was, that was ridiculous. I've never seen anything like it. Um, never seen anything like it. So, anyway, let's get back to the 97 election, shall we? in government and who, who are you back so we had we had that interview didn't we so being is effective this is being is effective this is our way of doing it. this is our labor targets fly around as we call it you can see how they are uh, ranked by the size the blue block and this city three yellow blocks and one green block for applied cumry over there in keridigian three uh or gold blocks for the liberal democrat I, I mean i i i reckon that sherry and tone are probably gonna have a probably had a fight when he went back after she watched that interview she was probably like that little hussy what's she up to keep 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 your hands off <laughs> these blocks represent the gap between labor and these targets and this is not the battleground as such it's the battleground for labor it's labor's targets some of them as you can see like Tynemouth, the one i mentioned earlier a middle-sized block mr blair has to shoot that one down in order to get a labor majority at all portsmouth north a soaking great big block here majority of about nine thousand down there in the general election if mr blair hits targets like that he's going to win a landslide majority so what we'll be doing is flying around the country looking at the little boxes down here the hits and the misses as we go through the night and if mr blair can hit something like half of these targets or just over half as he crosses them when the real results start coming in there's london coming up there with simon hughes's southwark and bermondsey seat a great block of gold in the middle there now we go across the midlands with a little glimpse of rochdale another target for labor that should go down quite easily because labor are way ahead of the liberal democrats up in scotland there's malcolm rifkin where you'll be shot at sterling a tiny tile there michael forsyth seat and a seat up there at inverness which is also a labor target so there they are watch what happens through the night notice there are three essential clusters of seats for mr blair to aim at the northwest up here and Bradford and Leeds, vital targets there. Birmingham and the He's area around like there. He's going to be like a whack-a-mole demon right on those blue seat bars. There, Mr. Blair needs to hit if he's to get the overall majority. And then London, an essential cluster of targets here in the home counties in London. For example, quite an easy one to hit, just peeping out from under here, Angela Rumbold's seat in Mitcham and Morden. Easy one for Labour to catch. David. Peter, thanks very much. Well, let's go to Mitchum and Morden and hear perhaps a bit about Andrew Rumbill, but also about the targets in London and how Labour appear to be doing. Emily Buchanan is there. Emily? Well, in Mitchum and Morden here, the Labour Party is actually holding its cards quite close to its chest. And uh, although there was some applause after the result in Sunderland South, they're not being overly uh, outward sure about the, their celebrations yet. I spoke Marginal to a Conservative wood. Marginal Party wood. strategist and canvasser here who was completely Probably not. baffled Probably a no by from what me, the exit polls no are saying. 
he was saying that if the exit polls are right, then the Conservative Party has to totally rethink it's the way no it's me, canvassing. Because many of the voters he's spoken to seem to be implying that they had a lot of enthusiasm for Angela Rumbold, and he would even have been predicting Angela Rumbold increasing her majority, which of course looks very unlikely according to the say, exit polls. What you say is very interesting because it only needs a one, just under a two percent swing for Angela Rumbold to be defeated, doesn't it? Absolutely. I mean, it looks like a key target seat which Labour ought to easily win. In fact, it's one of the many seats around the inner city which Labour has been targeting to show that it can move into the suburbs of London. But we've also heard news of some of the marginals uh, outside of London, in St Albans, for instance. We hear that Labour... She, she's a bit too kind of like Cocker Spaniel kind of... Place. What's the a greyhound? She looks like a greyhound. That's the, that's the issue, may really. Win five seats in Hertfordshire and five seats in Kent. Traditionally, very, very strong Tory seats. Emily, thanks very much. Now, Carol Walker is in Birmingham, covering the whole Midlands scene. You heard what was said down there in Mitcham and Morden. Have you got any indications of whether the kind of wipeout that we've been talking about is likely to happen in the Midlands? Well, that certainly looks like a strong possibility here at the. National Indoor Arena in Birmingham. We're looking at the biggest multiple yeah, counties. Much in better. The she land. looks like at least she's got like here. you know Thatcher power hair and, and uh, you know. Will give us a very looks like she could be more of a goer. I reckon. Birmingham Edgbaston. We're hoping to have her in to the, the last next one. hour. Now that is a seat that has been a Conservative seat for 75 years. Used to be Dame Jill Knight's seat, and uh, Gisela Stewart for the Labour Party has very high hopes of achieving a five percent swing. Now that is 67 on Labour's target list of seats so if that one falls to the Labour Party that should give us a pretty clear indication of the way things are going shortly after that we should be getting Birmingham Hall Green she's Another a bit lesbian this she's a bit of a lesbian this one a Labour seat Looks and uh, councillor Stephen McCabe for Labour high hopes of a four percent swing there that one's number 51 on Labour's list of targets and incidentally also here we have Sir Norman Fowler who's got the second safest Tory seat in the land in Sutton Coalfield and I must say there is speculation that he might end up being virtually the only Conservative MP in this whole area. Okay Carol, thanks very much. And Sarah Barclay in Bury North. Well, in Bury North it's the sitting MP Alistair Burt, the Tory minister who set up the child support agency and it looks as if the results would be very close indeed, much closer I think than people had thought before. The uh, Labour candidate, David Chater, is not particularly well known locally. Alistair Burt has been a popular MP here for 14 years um, and it looks as if the result could be very close. Mm. Other seats to watch up here... The are batch Jester, of consultants were better on the last, uh, on the first hour, weren't they? ...small for strength swing to take it. Um, Rochdale, Southport and Hazel Grove, which the Lib Dems will be fighting for very hard indeed. Um, and in Blackpool, North and South, neither of which have ever been Labour before, it looks as though the Labour Party could win, um, particularly in, in Blackpool South. Sarah, thank you very much indeed. Let's go to Hamilton Stuart South, Wilson where we have a declaration. Brown, referendum Party, 316. Colin Stewart Gunn, Pro-Life Alliance, 684. Robert Dow Kilgour, the Scottish Conservatives and Unionist candidate, 2858. Richard Pitts, Liberal Democrat, 1693. George Robertson, the Labour Party candidate, 21,709. The, nu the, number of, the number of spoil papers, 26. I declare that George Robertson has been duly elected to serve in Parliament as a member for the Hamilton South constituency. Can that win? George Robertson, who is the shadow Scottish Secretary, probable Scottish Secretary in the Labour government, with a majority of 15,800 with the Scottish National Party there uh, in second place, Robinson, Conservatives in third. You for a Let's just hear from Mr Robertson. For making Hamilton South the first constituency result in Scotland and I think perhaps the second in the whole country. That is a great, a great achievement. Now, did that seat, did this seat here that we're watching go to the SNP later? I reckon it did, actually. And of, and of course, can I thank with you all of your staff, both here and in the polling stations all day, for a, a magnificent effort that added up uh, to the result here this evening. Also to the police and to all those who have been involved uh, in this count. This evening, we are here at a historic time when a historic decision has been taken for our whole country. It is clear from these first two results and indeed from the exit polls 
that there is going to be a Labour government in this country after 18 years and that this country will move in a completely new and better direction. And in this campaign in Scotland, the Scottish Labour Party... What's hilarious is that the women in the chat are now saying would or would not for the male politicians. <laughs> One of them's like, oh yeah, hard pass on this guy, hard pass. <laughs> I don't know if Shalott is around for the playing, uh, playing who would you do. We did it with Scotland, and we did it for Scotland, and for all the people in Scotland as well. And as we move forward now into a completely new era for our country, the people have placed their trust in us, and we will fulfil that trust for them as well. George Robertson there, likely to be Secretary of State for Scotland. Well, we can now join Edwina Curry, who's with Martin Bashir at her count. She, remember, you said, said it would Mrs. be a miracle Curry, if she won. Martin. Thank you, David. Mrs. Curry, you've heard the BBC's own exit poll suggesting the worst Conservative share of the vote this century. Your reaction to that? Well, I'm disappointed that it's as low as that. Uh, my prediction would have been about 33, 34 percent based on what we were finding here in South Derbyshire. But there is no doubt that uh, we're going to have a very poor... This was a uh, major's bit on the side, wasn't it? Start tonight. Who's to blame? What's gone wrong? My impression from our polling here has been that People changed their minds, switched over, actually quite a long time ago, 92, 93 perhaps. Uh, but once Mr Blair came in and started to uh, revolutionise his party and modernise it, then a lot of the resistance to voting Labour also disappeared. And at that point, I think they had it made. Has it been a problem with policies or simply with presentation? I think it's been a bit of a problem with everything and uh, a, a serious analysis has to be done. But one thing is for certain, uh, I've always... There's an alarming amount of woods on Edwina Curry in the chat. What the hell's wrong with you all? Get out of it. ...said that the, the electorate here has never voted into office. Never. She's a no. ...that is antagonistic to Europe. And that looks as if it's happening once again, that moving Eurosceptic, Martin, has done us no good whatsoever, and the electorate have rejected us. You said earlier that if the Tories lost disastrously, then you would recommend that John Major shouldn't, in your words, hang about. Is that still your view? Well, I know some of my uh, pro-European colleagues feel that, that John Major ought to hang on and uh, perhaps even stay till October or November for the sake of party unity. Your view? But I think that would be a disaster. I think it would be a tragedy for the man who is an honourable and decent man who's, uh, I think, been very battered right through this campaign. My preference is that we should get the leadership contest underway as soon as this election is out of the way. Uh, and uh, I hope they'll make the right choice. Who's your favoured candidate for that leadership contest? I think it depends who's going to come forward, who is prepared to put himself or herself uh, into the ring. Do you have a favourite yourself? Well, my favourite used to be John Major. Uh, what I hope is that we have somebody who is wise. <laughs> John Major was definitely your favourite, wasn't it, Edwina? <laughs> insensibly pro-European and can carry the nation forward. Mr Michael Portillo has been mentioned as a potential leader, in fact, uh, by a number of the national newspapers. They are naming him as the favourite. Your reaction to him as a potential leader? Well, I think in this area, in the Midlands, in these marginal seats, uh, somebody like Ken Clark would go down much better. But then, of course, he is a Midlands member, and we know him very well in Nottinghamshire. And possibly after that, Michael Heseltine, if there are uh, no worries about his health. Uh, after that, I think we should be looking at somebody like Jill Shepherd. Um, They're being really presumptuous about who's going to keep their seats, I think. I mean, sorry to give away spoilers, folks, but some of these uh, people don't keep their seats, do they? If she holds her seat, which, of course, is, is being talked about. But we have to see. What I'm not certain about is an anti-European, very right-wing, rather extreme personality will simply make sure that we go into the next election campaign in exactly the same sort of state we've gone into this one. And that's Mr Portillo, as far as you're concerned? Uh, they're all very good and honourable people, and they're all rather shrewd people. They may well get there by being right-wing, but they may then stay by being more sensible. Thank you very much. Look at these disgusting creatures, regime creatures, even back then. Even back then. Tell you what, if they had gone with Portillo, they would have had a chance against Blair. I'm telling you that now. They'd have gone, if you go and watch that Portillo speech from 1994, if they'd gone with him, this would have been a different story. Even against the Dark Lord. Martin Bashir with Edwina Curry. Well, uh, she was talking about Michael Heseltine, but saying that she preferred Ken Clark. Michael Heseltine himself, imperturbable as ever, arrived a moment ago at the Tory party headquarters in Smith Square in London. And um, that's the first big arrival there. We've been told that a number of ministers are going to turn up there over the night. 
So, let's hear a bit more now from Jeremy. Jeremy, to you. Oh, one not... thing I should say. I don't know whether you heard, but the, the two report. I thought rather interesting. Two reporters, one in the northwest and one in the southeast, Mitchum and Morden, saying that what they were hearing on the ground... Can, can I just say, Britain is booming is one of the worst campaign slogans I've ever seen. ...and was that the swing wasn't of the scale or the wipeout wasn't of the scale that we picked up on the exit poll. I mean, whether this is right or wrong, one doesn't know until one gets results from there. But obviously, either the Tories are, are bluffing or something slightly... Boom, a, boom a slogan, quite literally. <laughs> Britain is booming. Terrible. ...different is happening from what we said. Very interesting. I don't know. We'll find out. Perhaps I might get some indication now. We're going to be talking, I think, to Stephen Dorrell, who joins us from his uh, account. Um, how bad is it, Mr Dorrell? Well, the answer is, of course, we don't know whether it's good or bad until the votes have been counted. Both in 1987 and in 1992, uh, we were served up exit polls which predicted Labour governments. Cope. And in the event, there wasn't a Conservative cope, government cope, elected cope, cope. by the voters. So we don't <laughs> know what the result cope. is. And I don't think it's very sensible to speculate about it when we all know that the result, the true Do result, you? is going to be available within What's a few the point hours. Of this Do you cope? agree with Edwina Curry that it was the divisions in your party and particularly the behaviour of the Eurosceptics that did for you? I don't accept by any means that the result of the election has yet been decided, or at least that it's yet known. Delusional. Delusional. Uh, I do agree with what I heard Michael Portillo saying earlier on in your programme, namely that uh, a party that presents a united face to the electorate is a party that strengthens its claim to their support. But that it, is clearly true. If a party cannot be forced into unity by one leader, isn't it time to change the leader? No, I don't think that we need to get into speculation about what the lessons are from a result that we don't yet know. So you think John Major should better. stay? I think we should. it is better for us to oh. uh, take these issues one at a time. The first thing we need to know is what is the decision that the voters have made. And only when we know that can we then start to think about what lessons the voters have uh, been seeking to teach uh, the Conservative Party. Mr. Dorrell, thank you. We're also joined now by uh, Malcolm Rifkin, the Foreign Secretary from oh, here we uh, go. his uh, account. Uh, how bad is it for you, Mr. Rifkin? Well, I don't know any more than you do at the moment. They're just beginning to uh, <laughs> add up the... <laughs> there are Paxman Woods in the chat. <laughs> There's a Paxman Wood in the chat. Can you believe it? Total votes before they distribute them between the candidates, so you'll have to be patient just a little bit longer. Just so we're clear that the cabinet is at least united on uh, this matter, you do share the view of Stephen Dorrell and Michael Portillo that what damaged you, what did for you, was the fact that you were divided. Well, I think there are a number of factors, but obviously any party that gives the impression of not being united, that cannot help you in an election. Are you confident you'll hang on to your own seat? I'm extremely hopeful. There's some quite encouraging yes. signs. But <laughs> Malcolm Rifkin should have been like presenting Open University at three in the morning in like the 1970s or something. <laughs> what the hell is this physiognomy I'm in? I frankly don't know any more than you do at this stage. I would be guessing. <laughs> being and hopeful isn't quite the same as being confident, is well, it? Well, it's because you're asking me to predict it. I mean, are you just wanting me to use the usual optimism that all candidates use, or are you trying to find out if I have some privileged access to information? I haven't counted the ballots yet, so I don't actually know any more than you do, but I'm very happy to sound optimistic. How long do you think John Major will stay? At <laughs> Why did Tony Blair landslide this election? Let me wonder. <laughs> Get out. Leader. Stay as long on as he wishes. Uh, <laughs> what do you mean beyond tomorrow? I, I'm sure much longer than that. Malcolm Rifkin, thank you very much. Davis. Thank you very much. <sighs> thank you, Jeremy. Well, now, um, Tony King, let's just go back to that second mm. result we had mm. uh, in Scotland, Hamilton South. Yes, we shouldn't ignore the result in Hamilton no. South, quite apart from the fact that George Robinson is likely to be a cabinet minister within the next uh, 36 hours. In fact, the swing in Hamilton, if we look just at the swing from Conservatives to Labour, was 8%. Our exit poll was predicting a swing from Conservatives to Labour in Scotland. Don't like this guy, by the way, because he's no butler. Bring back butler! Of almost exactly 8%. So it does look as though the exit poll is more or less spot on. We may produce a slightly smaller majority than was earlier anticipated, but it is still going to be an enormously good result. Notice the other thing about Hamilton South is the Scottish National Party actually losing a few percentage points. 
This was going to be, they hoped, a big night for the SNP. Well, it didn't work out quite that way in that particular constituency near Glasgow. We're joined by the uh, Deputy Prime Minister, Michael Heseltine, from the Conservative Party headquarters. Mr. Heseltine, good evening. Thank you for joining us. Well, you've already started to say that this uh, campaign needs careful analysis, uh, suggesting that you accept it hasn't quite worked out as you hoped. Well, the opinion polls haven't worked out, and the exit polls haven't worked out, and the first result hasn't worked out. But uh, as everybody knows, these are not yet an analysis of the full results, and we therefore have to be cautious about it. Cope. But it is certainly disappointing at this stage. Michael Portillo says that it's disunity that was the problem for the Tory party. Would you agree with that? Well, I think it's important to have a mature period of reflection, to look at all the questions, all the answers. And what is critical is that the... I'll give you a mature period of reflection. <laughs> you went into an election against Tony Blair with people like Malcolm Rifkin in the cabinet. I mean, hello? <laughs> the party finds a way to regroup, unite, and begin the fight back. We are a hugely successful political party, governing this country far longer than any other political party. And uh, what I do think is a great danger is now to sort of get into a sort of unin feeling process uh, in the, uh, the heat of election results, uh, which uh, are frankly, the analysis is better done within the private discussions that must go on within the Conservative Party. What does regroup mean? Regroup is simply what you do when you have uh, found yourself on the wrong end of an election defeat, if that's what happens to us. Uh, does it uh, imply that the Prime Minister will resign as leader of the party? Well, I hope not. I've spent, uh, well, whatever months and years it is, doing everything I could to help him uh, uh, govern the country, to win this election campaign, and I think that he has proved... I mean, good, 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 jo good job, uh, Tarzan. You fucking knifed Thatcher, the only uh, leader strong enough to win election after an election. Um, you, you, you knifed Thatcher... Saddle the party with Major as the as the Prime Minister. And then, as per usual, the Tories ripped themselves apart with the usual kind of disunity and psychodrama and left the door wide open for Blair to just curb stomp. Uh, <laughs> curb stomp his way to the, one of the biggest majorities of all time. That's basically what happened. But, uh, yeah, regroup. Uh, of the highest calibre as a Prime Minister, I have no doubt at all that uh, his period in office will be seen as having laid the economic rocks of opportunity for this country as the next century dawns. Uh, he has proved a very extraordinary leader of our country and I had very much wanted to see him re-elected to that job. And I He hasn't though, has he? I mean, he hasn't. He, Major was not an extraordinary leader of this country. He was a fucking shit Prime Minister uh, who literally nobody remembered until he cropped up to try to undo Brexit. However, as did you. indicated that that would have been the position. But surely if he's led you to the worst defeat for the Tories since the Duke of Wellington, you can't be saying that he should continue to lead you to the next election. Well, people have spent quite a lot of time trying to separate myself off from the Prime Minister and they've always failed. Uh, I've been proud to serve him and uh, greatly honoured when he made me Deputy Prime Minister. Uh, I've given him every support and as long as he's leader of the Conservative Party, he will continue to get that support. So you're... I, I also don't give Major much credit for the 1992 win because he was up against... Uh... You're right! I mean, come on. Kinnock was not Kinnock. Somebody who looks like Neil Kinnock was never going to win an election. Ever. Just, just because of his voice, just because of what he looks like. Saying you're standing beside him until he makes his decision, you don't have any inkling what his decision would be? No, I am going to back him all the way, because uh, without the slightest shadow of doubt, on the record, he has achieved what very, very, very few leaders of our party and prime ministers have done, an economic prospect which is glittering as the next century dawns. And why should the electorate have sleepwalked, in your words, to disaster? Well, those are the sort of questions we'll have to ask ourselves. And uh, as I said, I don't myself go for the sort of unimpeeling technique uh, within an hours of the polls closing. I think these require mature reflection. A lot of very senior colleagues will want to play their part in it. And there is absolutely nothing to be gained from a debate when one person says one thing, one says another, one asks one question, one gives a different answer. That is a... I mean, th think about what happened now, right? After their period of mature reflection, they settled on William Hague, right? And 
if you remember, just a couple of weeks ago, we read William Hague's plans for this country, far more radically left than even Blair sounds these days. So I see what happened under Blair as a kind of um, it, it, it was like they it was like Blair made the Tory party like reek. Do you ever see Game of Thrones? Do you remember what uh, Ramsay Bolton did to did to reek over over the period? William Hague is the political equivalent of reek. Because if you go back to 1997, he actually still said vaguely conservative things back then. Now he is so like, it, it is like all of the Tories have performed kind of castration on themselves since this time. Because they drew all of the wrong lessons. All of the wrong lessons. As if people voted Blair in for policy reasons, not for the superior discipline uh, and superior presentational style and uh, campaigning that they did. It wasn't the message. It wasn't the policies. It was just the fact they were better at this than these dweebs. Um, unfortunately, the, the Tory party's long and hard reflection drew the opposite conclusion. They, they thought it was because of a bunch of policy proposals and, uh, the, the, you know, ideas like that you know oh britain really loves like gagging on immigration way which is very fascinating to the media but it is not the best interest of the conservative party but of course it did sound as if you weren't blaming your colleagues but blaming the electorate when you said they were sleepwalking to disaster well, if they it, voted it, labor i, I think, there, I, voters think out I, there are at fault. I, I must tell you that whilst i have to respect the verdict if that is what it is to be uh, i have to tell you that uh, the views that the Prime Minister expressed of the consequences of Labour government will become apparent rather more rapidly, I suspect, than people have ever realised. Mr Heseltine, thank you very much. Thank you very much. Michael Heseltine, Deputy Prime Minister. And now we go around some of the key... I mean, if you really want to boil it down to why did the Tories lose this election, it's because Blair was like a fucking rock star in 1997 and this cabinet were like a group of bullied nerds. They all come across like bullied nerds who deserve to like have their heads flushed down the toilet. That's basically how they all come across. Whereas uh, not just Blair's, not just Blair, but his whole crew have a kind of vibe that they can handle themselves a little bit. Um, it, it just, just pure optics is, is what won this election, not policy stuff. The only policy that Blair got right was n not a kind of, you know, militant left wing Corbyn style, hard left, you know, I'm not a communist, basically, so you can trust me. I suspect that was basically his thing. Oh, and by the way, you know, we're going to sort out crime. Just, just you know, v v vote for me because I, I don't look like Malcolm Rifkin, basically seats, the ones that will give us an indication of how things are going in this election. Andrew Harvey, first of all, is in Norwich North. Andrew. Yeah, David, it, it, we were hearing the message from the South East and the North West about the Conservative vote holding up rather better. That's the message we're getting from East Anglia too. They do claim that uh, their vote's holding up. They simply don't believe the exit poll figures. Mind you, that's not going to help them very much in Norwich North because it only needs a 2% swing here to, to push the seat over to Labour. Labour in Norwich has the reputation of being one of the best organised party in the country, and uh, that may have been crucial in, in bringing uh, the important votes in. We are expecting a declaration here in about an hour's time. They've put double the number of normal counters on here. They've got 100 people working away at the ballot boxes. So we should get a declaration from Norwich North in about an hour's time. OK, thanks, Andrew. And um, Mark Mardell in Basildon. Of course, Basildon was the seat that told everybody that the Tories had not only not done as badly, done a great deal better than the exit poll suggested last time round. What's the story tonight? Yes, I think that that's right. That early indication last time there was that huge grin on the face of David Amos, which I think is seared on the, on the minds of many. People are asking about Blair's time as a barrister. I don't think Blair actually spent any time as a bar barrister. He's been a politician. He, he, he was a politician from 1983 onwards. It was his wife who was the barrister. I, I think he had a very minimal actual time with a career. He, he was straight into politics. He's been a politician since 1983. 
notoriously one of the youngest uh, MPs ever, I think, Blair. Labour supporters, that first indication, well, it ain't going to happen again, partly because Mr Amos has fled to a safer seat, but also it seems that Labour have done very well here. They're pretty confident they've taken the seat. Interestingly, they say a lot of uh, votes going from the Conservatives to the referendum uh, candidate here, so that may be one, one reason. But it's an important seat because it's one that was Labour in the dim and distant past, was taken by the Tories in the Thatcherite uh, revolution of 79 and has never been taken, uh, taken back. So we're expecting a result here about half one from Basildon. And uh, Michael Crick in Wolverhampton South West. Michael. Yes, well, the big question here, David, is whether one of the great parliamentary mavericks, Nick Budgen, can hold on. Mr Budgen inherited this seat, uh, Wolverhampton South West, from uh, Enoch Powell 23 years ago and holds very similar views to Mr Powell on things like Europe, where he was one of the whipless space, rebels space, over Maastricht space, space. and so on. And indeed, he's raised the issue of immigration in this campaign. Space. Now, the parties here are saying they think it'll be close, but um, if the uh, exit poll and if the result in Sunderland is reflected here, then certainly Mr, Mr. Budgen will lose. And I was going around the polling station this afternoon and I found that roughly one in six of the people who said that they'd voted for Mr Budgeon last time uh, haven't done so today, in which case the, the House of Commons will lose one of its great independent spirits. Thank you very much Michael and Jill Dando lastly in Portsmouth North. Jill? Well, David, there does seem to be an aura of Labour confidence here. Now, whether that translates into local seats remains to be seen. We should know in about... Bearing in mind what happened to Jill Dando, I don't think would is appropriate about an hour's time because both constituencies, Portsmouth North, Portsmouth South, they're both being counted here and they're both aiming to declare at the same time. Now Portsmouth North has traditionally been quite a safe Tory seat but this time it's definitely a race between the Tory holder, the uh, Peter Griffiths, and the Labour candidate, a very local, well-liked man. He's been in politics for 26 years, Sid Rapson. Now he has said to us that he is allowing himself to feel very confident tonight. If Labour win Portsmouth North, it'll be an 8% swing. It's a hundredth on Labour's target list. 69.9% turnout in, Labour, in Portsmouth North. Portsmouth South, again, a very interesting constituency. It was uh, held on to in 1992 by the Conservative David Martin, as you may remember, by a very wafer-thin majority of 242. Uh, the Liberal Democrat Mike Hancock lo lost out then. You may remember Mike Hancock won for the SDP in 1984, subsequently lost to David Martin in 87. Now, the Lib Dems, it's second on their list. It needs just a 0.2% swing. But again, Labour are proving very strong in Portsmouth South. Their candidate, again, a local man, Alan Burnett, a university lecturer, and coincidentally, right. the university plays a very strong part in the Portsmouth life, about 11,000 students. So, of course, he may do very well. This was seen as a two-way marginal Portsmouth South, but it could very well go one of three ways. So, a very exciting time here in Portsmouth. Thanks very much. And now we go to... You can tell that the Princess Di look was kind of in, in, in around this time, can't you? It's kind of like uh, Diana Mania running wild. To our roving reporter, Frank Skinner. Well, I'm oh, here we go. of Harrogate and Nairsborough, and I'm looking for the returning officer. Philip. Hello, Frank. How are you? Good to see you. Hello. Nice necklace. Hello. So you're, you're the mayor of Harrogate and Nairsborough? Yes, that's right. <laughs> that's a bit of a job and a half. Oh, it's um, not too bad. Come on, good, it's good steady. Good now, steady tonight, job. tonight, you are the returning officer. It's actually it's quite posh up here, isn't it? The sort of place they keep a sheet of newspaper under the cuckoo clock. That's right, yes. You yeah. heard, have you? Yes, yeah. there. You, you know, in the Ashes series, there was that guy in the Oilers jacket. What was it? What was that show called? Uh, Nightline or whatever it was. Uh, you know, the guy who goes around the pizza shop and all that. These Skinner bits give me that kind of vibe. Uh, I kind of love it. I kind of love it. You're the returning officer, and you'll be reading this speech tonight. And we'll hear lots of these tonight. So give, right. we've got to give it a spin. Don't to give it a go. Yeah. I've been the returning officer for the constituency of Harrogate and Nairsborough. Do hereby declare. Oh, you're a bit northern. Two, at the two. You've gone common. What's wrong with being northern? Well, they don't like that up here, then. Do you want me to put my. Uh, put your what, posh Harrogate the and Nairsborough voice on. The posh Harrogate and <laughs> yeah. Nairsborough voice on. Right, here it goes. I, being the returning officer for the constituency of Harrogate and Nairsborough, do hereby declare that the number of votes cast in this election are... Cast, I like, a lot. That's with good. an R. You notice the R. Oh, right? very good. Now, <coughs> your, your big star Hard name R. up here is um, Norman Lamont. Yes. Of course. Yeah. Now, I wondered, because you hear this speech all night, you know, and the returning officer, blah, 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 if there's anything you could do with your speech that would maybe give it a bit more... Well, I could put a... Um, give it his... Well, you mean, do something to his name. Give well, Norman a, Lamont, for give example. It a, give it a, a, a French sound or a or native Scottish sound or something like yeah, that. Yeah, right, you now. mean like uh, French, let's do um, Le Mans. 
That would be great. Le Mans, yeah. without the T. OK, it's a motor race, but also it could right. be an MC, yeah. But what about... <laughs> motor. What about uh, Scottish? Scottish descent? Yeah. He's got a Scottish... He's, he's descent, descent Scottish. Um, right. Uh, Lament. Lament. That sounds... Mr. Lament. That sounds good to That's, me. Yeah. If you can speak... What the fuck is this? <laughs> what is this whole segment about? I don't even understand. Also, by the way, I'm absolutely loving the dingy walls. The dingy, like, brown, faded walls. I love it. One of them is for us tonight, and we'll be watching closely. That would be fantastic. Right. Okay. Now, you became a councillor the same day that Margaret Thatcher became Prime Minister. I do, right. yeah. And yeah. I, what I like, you knew where you were with Mrs Thatcher. Oh, you certainly knew where you were. It was just being there without a paddle <laughs> that I didn't like. <laughs> Ken Skinner there. And then uh, we've, the Chancellor of Exchequer, uh, Kenneth Clark, arrived a moment ago at his count at Rushcliffe. He's been reviled by Nicholas Winterton, who said actually said he, he'll be remembered, even reviled in history for his action, putting the blame for the poor Conservative general election campaign on Mr Clark, who's got a safe seat in Rushcliffe, and Sir George Gardner at Reigate, where he's standing for the referendum party, having insulted the Prime Minister and been kicked out by his own local party. And uh, he's standing there, not likely that he'll take that seat, but he's lost a lot of loyal Tories. And Sebastian Coe, down in the West Country. Freeway fight in Falmouth and Camborne. Doesn't Coe win? Liberal Democrats chasing him and Labour. Co, Co won, hot on the, hot on eight, the heels seven. of the Liberal Democrats. It's inside. It looks as though it's outside in daylight, but I think they're actually in a hall there. And Lance Price joins us now from Enfield. Michael Portillo's seat. Michael Portillo was here in the studio a moment ago, but he's uh, gone on his way back to his count there. Uh, Lance is... He's not in any trouble there, is he? Well, it would be astonishing if he was. It would take a swing of approaching 15% for him to lose this seat happen, here. Happen, but spoilers. the indications are, no one is predicting that Michael Patillo is going to lose this seat, but the indications from the Labour side are that they have been doing particularly well in wards where they thought they didn't stand any chance at all, where until last week or the week before, they weren't even really canvassing those wards, and they now think that they may have won them. So if that were to be the case, uh, accompanied by a, a lower turnout, perhaps, uh, among Conservative voters, then it could be a very tight result for Michael Portillo here. Lance, thanks very much. Jeremy. David, thank you very much. We're joined now from his uh, constituency in Hartlepool, from his count there, by Peter Mandelson, who will doubtless be uh, accorded the... Oh, amazing. It's Mandy. ...of being the architect of this Labour victory, if that's what it turns out to be. Our congratulations in order, Mr Mandelson. Uh, not yet, Jeremy, because we don't know the result, but uh, you are nonetheless very warmly welcome to Hartlepool. Well, that's very illuminating. Now, um, what, do you think was the, <laughs> what do you think was the thing that swung it for you? What swung it uh, was New Labour. I mean, uh, people have been coming towards us steadily over the last ten years, but it was the transformation of the Labour Party, the rebirth of the Labour Party in the last two or three years. Somebody in the chat asking who this is. This is the mastermind behind New Labour. With uh, this was Blair's like number one spin doctor, a lot along with Alistair Campbell. Years, right? We finally clinched it. For okay. People. Well, we have Neil Kinnock with us here in the studio. He was the man who gave you the job uh, originally. He did, um, in 1985. Yeah, well, why could you do it for Tony Blair and not for him? <laughs> we, he had to go off and fight a seat in 1992. The boy's got to look after himself. Anyway, he's done brilliantly. And I don't think anybody can take that away from him. And I'm, I'm delighted for him. I just wish he'd grow his moustache back. Okay. <laughs> David. No way. Thanks very much, Jeremy. T Tony Blair's house. We, we thought we were going to see Mr. Blair coming out of his house, but the curtain's been very f firmly drawn. So I think we'll wait for the curtain to flicker again, Jeremy. Okay. I mean, do you, I mean the, the difference between then and now, given that it was Peter Mandelson, the, the campaign organiser in each case, was, I suppose, that in 1992 you had a change of image, but you hadn't junked a lot of the policies. Now you've had a change of image and junked the policies. Well, the policies were changed, and... Basically, Neil, is it because you're bald and ginger and really Welsh, <laughs> and Blair isn't... <laughs> Uh, as Jettison, as Peter say. said, well, yes, they were, they were jettisoned. Some of the policies were jettisoned, others were extensively modified. Uh, but as Peter said, people were moving towards us. Uh, they needed, in some ways, first of all, reassurance that our changes weren't cosmetic, that they weren't simply 
electoral opportunism. And at the 1992 defeat, I said to the Parliamentary Labour Party, only time really would demonstrate that the changes were deep-rooted and completely sincere. And secondly, to some extent, uh, and I say this with no joy at all, people had to learn that the forecasts that we made about what would happen under a further Conservative government were actually accurate, and I think they've had that demonstrated. It's a pity that people had to suffer uh, features like negative equity in the meantime. But if you ditch cl Clause 4, you might have won that election. It's conceivable that it would have sharpened the mind of the party. I don't think that by itself would have made... You were too left-wing, Neil. Admit it. You needed the Dark Lord to come in and be like, all that left-wing bollocks, not even keeping a little bit of it. Get rid of it all. Basically, just run as a run as a sensible centre centrist. You know, lose all the socialist bollocks, um, and uh, th then you'll win. And that's basically what happened. Efficient difference. Um, Peter Mandelson, uh, all the forecasts are you will have a thumping great majority. Will that encourage Tony Blair to be what he told the Observer he was going to be, a lot more radical in government than he's seemed during the campaign? No, we will be implementing a radical set of policies, but they will only be the policies that are contained in our manifesto. Well, they're not very if, radical. If, if we, well, that's a matter of opinion. If we are elected as... New Spoilers, they were radical. They fucking were. New Labour, as I think is going to be the case, we will govern as New Labour and we will deliver what we have promised to deliver, nothing more and nothing less. Peter Mandelson, <laughs> thank you very much. David, we're about to get a third result of the night declared by the returning officer in Wrexham. Only two results have so far been declared in this general election at the, uh, at the counts and Wrexham is coming up and this is North East Wales and it's a safe Labour seat mining area and it's held by Dr John Marrick who's actually a mathematician rather a quiet presence in the House of Commons for 17 years or so he taught mathematics down at the University in Aberystwyth and what will be interesting here again it's Labour in first place 50% of the vote they got last time round the Conservative who's this swampy character here that's what I want to know who's that which has got 32% the Liberal Democrats 15% so It'll be an indication for us whether that exit poll is still standing up, as it has so far, Tony King, hasn't it? It's stood up very well so far. It'll be interesting to see whether John Marrick gets, depending on the turnout, about 23 or 24,000 votes. Uh, if turnout has stayed at its previous level, then that's what he should do. That did not happen in Sunderland South, which is why Chris Mullen didn't get quite as many votes as we were supposed. But the swing we'll be looking for would be sort of 11, 11 percent. Will be something will be like between uh, 10 and 12 percent, absolutely. Yes. They all seem to be standing there without much going on. I don't know what's happening because all the candidates are there and the returning office is in the centre. It's like a sort of... <clears throat> looks like a sort of um, rather embarrassed school prize giving. <laughs> they are early declarers by design. That's to say Very they're one of those yeah. places. Torbay used to be one, but isn't this year because of the local elections, which makes a point of getting its face on the television screen by being an early declarer. I just mentioned as they finish the, the, the bits and pieces that the, the turnout has been 71%. Um, turnout of 71%, he says. Well, Robin, what do you make of this, uh, the reports we've been having from our own correspondents out in the field, that the landslide doesn't feel to them in line with our exit poll. Do you think that's just... I think that's what they're being told by Tory party workers and Tory agents all through this campaign. Cope, We've had cope, Tories cope, saying cope, they are cope, absolutely cope. baffled by the opinion poll figures. Cope. They can't understand why there isn't more feel-good factor coming through. And I think we're probably not getting as good a quality of canvasser as we used to get in the old days, particularly if too many people are doing telephone canvassing and not seeing the whites of their eyes. Because if you go around as a journalist at a by-election, you follow the canvassers to the doorstep, People on the doorstep are very polite. The British are a polite nation. They don't like to say they're not going to vote I for mean, somebody. The first and when you speak to them afterwards, they say, I wouldn't vote for that shower if they came down the driveway with a barrow full yes. of fibers. And the first reports from Conservative Central Office where they... <laughs> I wouldn't vote for that shower. <laughs> Amazing. I wouldn't vote for that shower. They were shattered by the exit poll and they were shattered by what, what they were hearing from their own constituencies. I think they're quite genuinely surprised yes. because that's not the message they've got on the doorstep. Yes.
Tony Blair, Complete first glimpse shot. of him at his house, Marabella in Trimden. He's going from there to the Count. There he is, the man who will be Prime Minister tomorrow when he goes to Buckingham Palace, probably late tomorrow morning. And that's Alistair Campbell, his press secretary. There's Mr. Blair behind. Well, we... There he is. There we are. Just a brief glimpse of Tony Blair. And he'll be going down to his count. He's then going to go to the trim. Tony Blair Club is in the building. There, and then it's planned to go down south later on today. We're joined by Gordon Brown now. Uh, from Ooh. Dunfermline East. Mr. Brown, good evening. Thank you for joining us. Well, it looks as though you're going to be Chancellor of the Exchequer by tomorrow afternoon. Well, I think we'll wait and see. I think uh, I'm waiting for my results. I think you've had uh, two results uh, so far. Uh, it looks as if Labour has done very well, but uh, I was the one who said to all our candidates on Monday, take nothing for granted, and I will stick that way for the time being. It's rare to see you smiling quite so much on a television interview, Mr. Brown. I suspect you... I, I always smile when I'm interviewed by you, David. Uh, well, <laughs> save the flattery. I suspect you know that you've won, and won by a very handsome margin. Well, if we have won, I think it's not just a rejection of the Conservatives. It is about new Labour. It is about a new type of politics for this country. I think it's a desire on the part of uh, everybody to tackle the very real social problems that form the basis of our manifesto. And it's a desire also that we have a government that will equip us for the future, a government that is on people's side. And I think that is why people have been voting Labour in increased numbers today. How different is it from having, say, a majority of 30 or 40, if you really do have a landslide on the scale of 1945, in terms of what well, you can do in government and what you plan to do? I mean, we, well, remember, well, we remember Tony Blair saying he'd be more radical than people thought. Well, by radical, what Tony Blair meant is that we'll tackle the problems of education. We'll tackle the problems of the health service. We'll tackle the problems of unemployment. Uh, Look at the, the, the Gordon Brown mouth. He can't help it. He's got some sort of condition where he just has to do that with his mouth. Uh, this was a manifesto about uh, change in Britain and about making possible uh, a country that is properly equipped for the future. Uh, so we are ready to get to work if that is the verdict of the country. It is not simply a rejection of the Conservative Party. It's an endorsement for a new type of politics. And we fully intend to bring that about. But uh, it, th there's not an element in that uh, we're going to be more radical than people thought of we are the masters now, the famous phrase not that was uttered the a, last time Labour had a landslide like this. N not at all, not at all. We will honour our manifesto, we'll fulfil it. I think look at me, look at me. I'm the master now. I think the feature of this election is that uh, people thought the Conservatives, and rightly so, had betrayed the trust that they had got from the British people in 1992. It was a record of broken promises. We are determined that there is a bond of trust between a new government and the British people. And it certainly would be my intention, whatever, whatever job I hold, it would be my... wonder why Brown lost in 2010 and Blair won three times. It's, oh, it's a mystery, isn't it? It's a mystery. It's almost like people don't vote on policies or anything like that. They just vote on who's more likeable. My intention to build that trust between God, the government boring. and the people. Uh, this is not just a result about the past. This is a result that is an endorsement for a new type of politics. Ooh. It is now our duty to bring about. I thought you had been assured that you were going to be Chancellor of the Exchequer. I don't think you take anything for granted. As I said to all my candidates on Monday, I'll wait and see. OK, Mr Brown, thank you very much indeed. Thank you very much. Um, Rex and the Party candidate, 8,688. Cronk, John Edwards, Edward, the Referendum Party candidate, 1,195. Low, Nicholas John, Natural Labour Party, 86. <laughs> Marek John, the Labour Party candidate, 20,450. Cronk. <laughs> Plant, James Kevin, Plaid Cymru, 1,170. Thomas, Andrew Martin, Liberal Democrat, 4,833. And that John Marek has been duly elected to serve as member for the Wrexham constituency. The number of ballot papers rejected... So John Marek holds the seat, his majority 11,700 Conservatives in second place. But, 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 and a big but, this is the swing in this third result. 7% from Conservative to Labour. So a lower swing, well above the amount that's needed for a substantial Labour victory, but below the kind of 11% swing that we got from the first two seats. Tony, what do you make of that? That's absolutely right. It does look as though there's going to be a considerable drop in the turnout in these very safe Labour seats. And it's very hard to say what the effect of, on the swing of that is going to be. 
Uh, but notice, as you said a moment ago, a swing of 70% would have Mr. Of 7%. 7%. 70% well, say, would yes. have. <laughs> <laughs> it's the kind of language we've been talking till now. W would have Mr. Blair very comfortably in Downing Street indeed. Tony, um, Peter. Well, David, yes, you have to see how cautious you must be about these early results because here we have now, there's the pendulum at zero and the swing, of course, is to Labour. Now, here is the swing in Wrexham. On beyond 4.5% that they believe in overall majority, but stopping at some 7.5% to Labour. Now, we think from our exit poll that these safe Labour seats like Wrexham, and I'm going to go on now to Sunderland South, and Sunderland South are likely to produce smaller swings than the seats held by the Conservative, particularly the Conservative marginal seats, but of course we can't be sure until we get real results from those seats. But that Wrexham swing clearly is rather under what our exit poll was suggesting might happen in safe Labour seats. So we have to be cautious, but we're still looking at a very solid Labour majority indeed. We're waiting for a Conservative held seat before we can be certain, David. Thank you very much. I think that the Tories may well have conceded Southport to the Liberal Democrats, <laughs> but we shall hear about that in a moment. Jeremy. David. Well, now, Cecil Parkinson, you're now chairman of a fertiliser firm. And how deep is the mess <laughs> you're in at present? Well, I, th I think we're clear. I, I'm chairman of a number of other companies, too, by the way. Artificial that just seems the most appropriate Ar one. Ar <laughs> artificial fertiliser, just the record. Oh, right. fertiliser. Um, very dangerous stuff to immerse oneself. on. Well, I, I think that clearly we're not going to have a, a good evening. It's very early days. I would have thought it's fairly clear we will have a Labour victory, but uh, I think uh, I don't buy any of this analysis about disunity and so on. We've just been there for 18 years. It's 23 years since the Labour Party last won an election. Mm. And, and I think the mood that I found going around the country, people were saying, look, it's just time for a change. I was coming down in the train the other day from Birmingham, a couple of businessmen, businessmen said, look, I'm doing very well. But I just feel you've been there long enough. It's time for a change. And I think that that is the most emotive political uh, argument. And I think it's a very compelling one when a party's been in power for as long as we have. Um, David Steele, we've yet to... to, to look, 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 look how easily the Tories are just like, yeah, we've just been... We've, yeah, I know. We, we, we've just been in power for too long. Time for a change, I suppose. Toodlo. <laughs> that was literally what you said. You know, just got to take it on the chin. It's all right. I've, I'm only the chairman of about 15 different companies. Well, I'll be all right. To have a Liberal Democrat, a meaningful uh, Liberal Democrat uh, result from anywhere, but from where you stand, what is actually happening? Do you share Cecil Parkinson's view? It's just general ennui? I share that very much. I think, <clears throat> I think the Conservative Party was on the hiding to nothing at the start of this campaign. Supposing there had never been any divisions, supposing the economy was wonderful and all the things the Prime Minister said was true, I still think that they would have lost because I think that there has been a mood for change coupled with the modernisation of the, of the Labour Party and a strong Lib Dem campaign. I, I just want to mention something here, by the way, right? Given what you heard from Cecil Parkinson just now, Basically, that was a man who was just like, yeah, I'm fucking done. Let's just, let me just play golf and chill out. You know, we've only screwed the country up. Uh, you know, it's time time for some other lot to screw up the country even more. Um, do you think that was it for Parkinson? No. Will it, William Hay brought him back. <laughs> in, in, in the summer of uh, 97, William Hay thought it would be a great idea to bring Cecil Parkinson back as a lord in the shadow cabinet <laughs> made him the chairman of the conservative party oh it's so clueless they are they really are oh man i think they they had no chance of winning in fact they messed it up as well but that's why they're losing so badly it does sort of tie in with what you were saying neil kinnock doesn't it? that it needed that extra term in your view in order for for Labour to go that extra distance? In some respects, yes. But what makes the difference uh, between the scenario that David describes, rightly, and what's happening now, is the way in which the electorate punishes divided parties. And we've got every reason to know in the Labour Party uh, that that punishment can be savage. I think that one of the major factors, not the only one, that's actually producing this outcome tonight, 
is the way in which the Conservative Party, especially in the last three or four years, has given the impression that it takes itself more seriously than it takes the country. We, for a short period, gave that impression. We've been paying the price ever since. And I believe that the Conservative Party is in that experience yeah. now. Uh, naturally, I hope that it will continue for some time. Senator Parkinson, when do you think that the party started to, to, to fall apart? I don't think the, the well, party has... Well, you were talking has, about divisions. I don't think the party has fallen apart. I, I say that those, that has not been particularly relevant. The fact that the Conservative Party is the only party of, of the two major parties, mm. the only one of the two, that has had a real debate on what is a critical issue. Yeah, but Europe. it's done it in public. I don't think... Well, I, I okay, mean, I'm, going I, to I'm going to interrupt you there oh, because Tony Blair, Blair is, uh, is walking. Tony Blair, Ladies and gentlemen, Tony Blair, Blair, Blair is walking. And in Shimden, a crowd outside, the man who will be the next Prime Minister. There he is, high five in, and it's like Bret Hart coming out or something. Well, being congratulated by people in his Sedgefield constituency. Just a brief appearance, I think, before he sets off to the Labour Club or goes down to the Count. Still being cautious, let's just wait and see. Throughout this campaign, of course, he's been constantly saying we mustn't count our chickens before they're hatched. He'll be only the fifth Labour Prime Minister this century if he gets this job, or when he gets this job, because we're certain he will. Age 44, one of the youngest. Well, Robin, we've only had... Uh... Can I just say that um, Cecil Parkinson even though, you know, he was very like, like kind of laid back and he'd given up and all that. He gave me he gave off the vibe of somebody like Sir Roger Moore or someone like that. It is a kind of a a type that you don't really see in public life anymore. That generation of kind of you know he he has got a gentility and a smoothness about him. Roger Moore had it as well and just men of that particular generation you just don't see that anymore. Uh, I don't know what generation was that. The uh, would that be um, when was he born? See, he was born in 1931, so he'd be what like silent generation, I guess. Um, is that right, or even even older than that? But uh, it, I I don't know. I kind of like that. But I kind of like uh, Parkinson's general vibe. He just shouldn't have been in front like frontline politics in 1997. That's all. Three results in. We're talking all the time about this landslide for Labour. Seven uh, percent in Wrexham. Pretty good landslide. It still looks very, very hopeful for Labour. There's nothing we've had on any of the figures from any of the seats declared so far to make us doubt the indications of the exit poll. Labour have undoubtedly had a very successful campaign. It was an amazingly disciplined and professional campaign and they managed to stick to their chosen subjects all the way through. The, Tony Blair stuck to the idea of deliverable promises, measurable things on class size. Paxo was definitely a Daria. Paxo was. He, that was his whole personality. So kind of always sceptical and quizzical and you know. His hospital waiting lists, kind of things that resonated with the electorate in practical terms compared to the Tories talking in a much more general sense about concepts like choice and opportunity which really didn't go down the same way. What's the effect going to be politically if they do have a very large majority? Is that going to mean they get trouble from the Labour left wing over Europe, for instance, over other issues, pressure to spend more money when, if the economy goes on recovering, pressure to do things that Tony Blair was very cautious about. Well, it was a former Tory chief whip, Francis Pym, who uh, incurred uh, Lady Thatcher's ire for suggesting that too big a majority wasn't a good thing. But it's significant that it was a former chief whip who said that, because uh, you do tend to get much more cutting loose on the back benches when backbenchers feel that they can afford to indulge a protest and a smaller majority acts rather more as a discipline. Okay. Interesting. You may have seen that headline go across. We'll have all the results, incidentally, on the screen during the night. Uh, Sunderland North went across as a Labour hold, and this is the result. This is the fourth result to come in. Let's just see it. And it's held by William Etherington. It's a very safe Labour seat, but the key thing, again, is the swing. And it's in line. It confirms 10% swing from Conservative to Labour. He's been there since 1992. So we have had four results in so far. We're saying on the basis of that that Tony Blair will be Prime Minister. 
and that he is going to have a landslide. And what we're predicting is that it'll be the biggest ever Commons majority for Labour. And the lowest Conservative share of the vote since over 150 years ago. Peter Mandelson, who manages campaign for Labour, told us a moment ago what swung it was simply new Labour. It was the transformation of the Labour Party, the rebirth of the Labour Party. And Malcolm Rifkin, speaking from Edinburgh Pentlands, his constituency, said any party that gives the impression of not being united doesn't help itself during an election campaign. Edwina Curry in Derbyshire South, it's clear that going you're a skeptic <coughs> didn't help the Conservatives one jot and it didn't bring in votes, it drove voters away. And these are the... That was bollocks though, wasn't it, Edwina? ...highlights of the night so far. just had the Sunderland North result. Here are the other three results we've had, and you'll see the evidence of the swing there. Sunderland South, that was the first one that came in, Chris Mullin, with an 11% swing. And then there was Wrexham, where John Marrick held the seat. The swing rather smaller there, 7%, but still very nearly double what Labour needs to form an overall majority. George Robertson's seat, Hamilton South, where the SNP come in second place, so the swing is uh, not a two-party swing shown in the normal way, so we don't show it. But uh, he did well there. And uh, Putney, the count is going on there. Putney. David Mello, Sir James Goldsmith, Anthony Coleman, the Liberal, uh, Labour challenger rather, the leader of Merton Council. And as uh, we were saying a moment ago, all of the millionaires, there's David Mello, looking fairly chirpy. He lost his post in cabinet as Chief Secretary of the Treasury and then as Heritage Minister over a number of indiscretions and he was almost unseated by the Conservatives in Putney. They mounted a challenge against him but he survived that. He'd gone on to make a career in broadcasting but does a massive amount of consultancy work as well and uh, may not be in much difficulty in Putney. There's a lull while the counts go on at Oldham East there. John Hudson for the Conservatives there. That would need a very small swing for Oldham East to be taken. Basildon, where we were a moment ago. Labour's 29th target. Mitchum and Morden, where Dame Angela Rumbold is defending a majority of just under 2,000. Needs only a very tiny sing, uh, swing there. And uh, Nick Budgeon's seat. There's Mr. Budgeon himself in Wolverhampton looking concerned. He does lose, by the way. Everybody waiting. We've only had four results in. It's going very slowly tonight. As I said, it would because of the county councils in England being I am sorted read out. Super the ballot chats. papers being sorted out takes them. just simply twice as, no, twice as long uh, to open up the ballot boxes and separate the um, ballot papers out before you can actually start the process of counting. And incidentally, Sunderland North, Sunderland South rather, uh, broke the record by 10 minutes, 47 minutes. They counted Chris Mullins' seat in. Tony? Can I just say one thing that I think people are losing track of? There's been a lot of talk of the campaign and whether the Labour Party did well during the campaign, thanks to Peter Mandelson. The Tories did very badly because of their disunity. But it seems to me perfectly obvious that the campaign, the last few weeks, has had very little to do with the actual outcome. This election was decided months, if not years ago. It was decided when the Conservatives made a shambles of managing the economy just after the last election. It was decided when Tony Blair became leader of the Labour Party and did such an extraordinary job of changing the party's constitution and its policies. If this election had been held a year ago or two years ago, the outcome would have been almost exactly the same. I think this, this focus on the campaign, this focus on a very short time period is a mistake. Let's go and find out a bit about how the Liberal Democrats are doing. We saw that they were polling 
18, 17, 18 percent, something like that, back where they were last time round, but that they could have a better result this time. Alenka Frenkel is in Torbay. Let's go there first. Of I, I disagree. I disagree with that guy, by the way, because um, if he was just about policies and people like having enough of the Tories, um, they could have stuck like anybody there. But clearly, Kinnock and Brown, Kinnock in 92 and Brown in 2010, show that um, it actually really does matter how you run the campaign. Um, the iron discipline of the, and also the subsequent Blair win. Don't forget, Blair won in 2005 after the Iraq war. Don't forget that. Everybody says, oh, Blair evil, you know, the Iraq war done him in. He still won after the Iraq war. After it came out about the the dossier and David Kelly and all of that, he still won. And he won because he was very good in the campaign. So I, 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 I disagree with the idea that the campaign doesn't matter. Of course the campaign matters. Of all, Lenka, the Liberal Democrats got any chance of taking that seat? Well, in the last few minutes, it is beginning to look as though that is a possibility. The Liberal Democrats are desperately hoping that this will be the breakthrough they've been looking for here, particularly in the southwest. What they're really hoping for is that if there is an anti-Tory, pro-Labour swing, that they could perhaps benefit from it and wipe out the 5,500 majority that Rupert Allison, the Conservative sitting MP, also known as Nigel West, author of Spy Thriller, Spy Thriller Writer, that they can wipe that majority out. I've just seen behind me in uh, the trays there that uh, the Liberal Democrat, who uh, is a, an experienced uh, parliamentarian in the sense that he's been working in the Parliamentary Whips office and uh, he's a Paddy Ashdown man, that his votes have been stacking up and they do now appear to be more plentiful than uh, Rupert Allison's. They're rather upset here at Torbay actually because uh, they're normally one of the first to declare, but uh, on this occasion, all the presiding officers were stacked up in their cars with the ballot boxes and searched for a full 15 to 20 minutes before they... No, I'm a no. I would not, uh, I would not give her a Frankel or a Frankfurt or whatever. No, 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 no. They're allowed to come in and it has sort of rather held them up. OK, Alenka, well, thanks very much. Do you know how soon it'll be before we get that result about? Well, they're, they're talking about 20 past 12, half past 12. Right. Thanks very much. That's... Uh, of tonight, the, the clear woods have been... I mean, Sophie Ridge, she doesn't really count because it was a, she's now, but clearly Ridge and Dando with, 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 the, with the picks of the female presenters. And a, now, and a, now and a bit. Nick Hyam is in Oldham Eastern Saddleworth. Um, and uh, Nick, what's going to happen there? Well, uh, nobody is very clear. This is a new seat which was uh, created uh, out of Littleborough and Saddleworth, a constituency which uh, went Liberal Democrat after being many uh, years Conservative in 1995, and uh, a former Oldham Central seat, which of course is fairly safe Labour. Uh, it's in, on paper a three-way marginal. Either party, any party could win it. In practice tonight, it's a Liberal Democrat Labour marginal. It seems that there could be as little as 200 or 300 votes separating the parties. The turnout has been quite high, nearly 75%, which might be thought to favour Labour, but their turnout has been lower in some of the wards where they hope to do well. So it's a very close run thing indeed. I think there's every likelihood that there could be a recount. We were expecting a result at about quarter to one, but clearly if there's a recount, it could be later here in Oldham Eastern Saddleworth. It was a, a spectacularly nasty by-election, at least everybody said it was. Has it been a nasty general election fight there? doesn't seem to have been. Uh, the Labour were very tough on the Liberal Democrats in the by-election. Uh, they accused the Liberal Democrat candidate of being uh, soft on drugs and hard on taxes. This time around it seems to have been much more gentlemanly, much quieter, and that I think is because the national spotlight hasn't been on it in the way that it was during a by-election campaign. Thanks very much, Nick. Well, we join Shankar Guha now in Rochdale, where again there's always been a very bitter battle going on between Labour and the Liberal Democrats. Is Liz Lynn going to hold on there for the Liberal Democrats? Well, it's way too early to say, and I'm afraid uh, the indications from the various agents and people we've been talking to uh, don't give us many clues at this. Well, he's a good-looking lad, considering his background, isn't he? Stage. Um, in theory, of course, this should be a very easy target for Labour. It's the fourth most uh, vulnerable marginal in the country, and they only need a 0.1% swing to shift Liz Lynn, who is the uh, uh, Lib, Lib Dems uh, Social Security uh, spokesman. And uh, unfortunately, at the moment, uh, we're not getting very much of a, a clear picture as to which way it's going. It could but go either way. Liz Lynn took over from Cyril Smith in, the, in, in this seat. Has she managed, like he did, to make a sort of impression on the community, get a hold on the community? That's what was a good album that came out in 1997? 
loads of good albums. Uh, Urban Hymns, No Way Out by Puff Daddy came out in 97. Life After Death by Notorious P.I.G. came out in 97. Uh, um, trying to think of some others now. Did, uh, what else came out in 1997? Um, I'll get back to you on that. I'll have a little think about it. Stands her in good stead as a general election. Was it was OK Computer 97? Hmm. Well, when you talk to the Liberal agents, certainly, uh, that's that's the line. And, uh, and, and yes, I think there is a feeling that she is a, a well-known national figure, not just locally, and she's been prominent in a number of local campaigns, which hasn't done her any harm at all. Um, but uh, up against uh, her this time, Labour have put uh, uh, Lorna Fitzsimmons, who is Fitzsimons, I beg your pardon, who is uh, a rising star of the Blairite uh, wing of the Labour Party. Um, and she was born in Wardle, one of, the, uh, one of the wards which has moved into this constituency as a result of boundary changes. Now, whether well, that's a bit of a wild card in, in, the, in the calculations here, it's a bit early to... I feel like Porter's head had an album out in 97, I seem to recall. ...say, but, you know, may well have helped Labour. Thanks very much indeed. Well, uh, old, old Bexley and Sidcup, the father of the House, the oldest candidate in this general election, the former Conservative Prime Minister, Sir Edward Heath, now 80 years old, looking hale and hearty. Wow! Wow! Ted Heath was still around. Oh, my God. Staunch pro-European, very critical about the way that the Tory party has gone on Europe during the campaign, and um, likely to win his seat. Bob Dylan's time out of mind was 97. So, bit of... Oh, and Jack Straw also is there, yes? Nick Cave and the Bad Seeds Boatman's Call was 97. This Jack Straw of Blackburn, the man who will be Home Secretary if he gets the job that he's been shad. I feel like that Prodigy album with Firestarter on it came out in 97. What was it called? Uh, the one with the crab on the front. What's that album called? It's got like Firestarter and Breathe and... F f uh, Fat of the Land, was it? Yep. Yeah at his count in Blackburn. Has a majority of 6,000 there. It's the seat that Barbara Castle used to have and he used to work for Barbara Castle as, his, as her uh, assistant before he went into the House of Commons. Like uh, many of these prominent Labour people, no real experience in government. They're all new to that. They'll all be on a, what is called a fast learning curve. Now, Peter Kellner, I'm told that you're getting reports from marginal constituencies. What was that other one? Do you ever rest? Think fighting the battle of who could care less. Ben Folds 5. Whatever and ever, amen. That was 97. About what's going on. And uh, what's the picture well, you're picking up? It's beginning to seep out. First of all, some more good news for the Liberal Democrats. It looks as if they've held Newbury in quite comfortably. That was a seat they won in a by-election from a couple of years ago. The significance of this is that for the last general election, the Conservatives won back all the seats they had lost in by-elections. It isn't going to happen this time. We're looking at perhaps a five-figure majority for the Liberal Democrats there. Birmingham Edgbaston, Labour needs a 5% swing there. It looks like they've got that and with a lot to spare. 10, perhaps a 12% swing in Birmingham Edgbaston. Wolverhampton Southwest, another seat requiring a 5% swing for Labour to take it. it. Looks as if they've got that. And the significance of this is that Labour weren't at all sure that they would get Nick Budgeon's seat. They thought that there would be local factors which would keep the swing down there, but they're now confident that they've taken that seat. And we add to that the reports we've had from Portsmouth, from Southgate, Mitchum and Maud and Angela Rumble's seats. They're saying there that the defeat for her is far worse than anybody was expecting. It does look as if the big swings are beginning to pile up in these marginal seats. It's curious that because they were very cautious from Mitchum and Morden when they were reporting it. But you... I feel like Mark Morrison's Return of the Mac came out in 1996. What about Fuji's? The score? Maybe 98. I think I've named all the top albums of 97 now. You're saying information now is that they're doing all right? Uh, the, what, what we understand is that, uh, that the Conservatives of Mitchell and more than them, they believe that they have uh, been defeated more Phonics heavily was 98. Uh, than they Phonics were was uh, believing a, a few days ago. OK, Peter, thank you very much indeed. We're joined by Carol Walker from Birmingham again. 
Uh, Carol, can you throw any more light on what's going on in the Midlands? Well, certainly we're expecting a result in about the next five yeah, minutes right. from Forced. Edgbaston, uh, which could be a very interesting result indeed. We're hearing it's looking very positive indeed, nothing definite yet, but very positive indeed for Gisela <laughs> Stewart for right. the Labour Party. Now, this is a seat... George Urban Hymns was the first one I named. ...that has been a Tory seat since 1922, used to be Dame Jill Knight's, Andrew Marshall now the candidate for the Tory party, but uh, we're hearing that it could be very positive for Gisela Stewart for the Labour Party and that result due in about the next five minutes. She had a rather odd campaign because she was born German, wasn't she, and is married to an Englishman. Foodies were not a one-hit wonder. They had Killing Me Softly, they had um, Fuji La, they had um, the song, the score, they had... Um, Ready or not, refugees taking over. Buffalo Soldier, Dreadlock Rasta. That was a hit as well. They had a number of hits, so you're wrong. And uh, there was some talk about on the doorsteps, people were saying, oh, you mustn't elect a German, and using rather rude a ruder word about it. Well, certainly, and I think there have been rumours that the Conservative Party were trying to exploit that. But I have to say that also the Labour Party have worked very hard indeed on the ground in this seat and in a number of others of these crucial West Midlands seats, which of course, as uh, you've been hearing, is part of the key battle. Is that the same song? Now that I asleep, sleep, walker, awake, those who could relate know the world ain't cake. Ground. And the Labour Party have been working very hard to, to build up the support and very hard throughout the day to... Remember them, the rap singers? <laughs> ...day to make sure that people actually go out and vote. And I'm sure that that must have helped to boost uh, what we believe and expect to be a, a win for Labour here. Carol Walker, thank you very much indeed. So that's, uh, that's it. I, I feel like Fat Boy Slim... I feel like Fat Boy Slim was later. Maybe 98 for Fat Boy Slim. I could be wrong, though. I could be wrong. Uh, okay. Um, let's have a look then. I will, I will endeavour, by the way, to uh, get the Stuart Lee stream back up and go through the relevant checks. I should have known that. I forgot. I took leave of my senses and forgot the BBC are really funny about stuff like that. So um, there we are. Um, all right. So let's do some super chats and then we'll get out of here. Narco Republican says, I hate comedians. However, what you say is correct. News anchors and comedians are some of the main sources of indoctrination these days. Remember, ridicule is the trib tribunal of supreme instance. He also says today, the 17th of July, marks the anniversary of the nationalist uprising in Spain. Viva Franco, arriba España. So that was Narco Republican on entropy. Uh, if ent I don't know if entropy kind of worked and then it kind of went off so I don't know what happened to that uh, I think I forgot to put it on here didn't I, I forgot to put the entropy on um, and then on the main super chats we've got Justinian the worst says how do you typically respond to midwits when in the course of discussing moral decay they say yeah x is degenerate but how does it affect you uh, I mean, my uh, response, first of all, is to try not to engage with midwits at all. Um, but uh, you can uh, remind them that you're living in a society and a community and what other people do in that community does have an effect on you. Uh, it does have an effect. The, the moral decay has an effect. Um, so, um, and then if you really want to, really want to lay it in, pull up the British STD stats that I shared a while back and, uh, then show them with numbers how people of a certain or sexual orientation, uh, actually have triple the STD rates of, uh, uh, of other people. Uh, you could then pull up stats on other things like child abuse, for example. I mean, there's many different ways you could go about it. But my main advice would be just don't bother. Just don't bother.
I just wouldn't bother about about it but at all. Monothalma says best case for the regime would be to keep Ukraine and the economy afloat until Trump gets back into office and then takes the blame for both falling apart. Very smart thinking, Monothalmus. Trump can then be the fall guy for when Ukraine doesn't win. Very smart. Devastator says for 20 Australian dollars, things can only get better. Uh, Alfonso Rides Again says, insane that the Tories had, lo had a lot of seats in London and Scotland just 25 years ago. The 90s looks like another planet from 2023. Yeah, that's true. Um, Devastator says, I am feeling a bit extra specially generous today, AA. Answer this question and your audience gets 50 subs. Audience, please don't assist, AA. Question. Name three countries Blair ordered combat troops to visit during his first six years. Well, that's easy. That's easy. Kosovo. Um, Sierra Leone. Iraq, Afghanistan. Four. There's probably others that I'm forgetting as well. But uh, yeah, those four. So there we go. There you go. So if you want to give out 50 uh, channel memberships, you should ask. You should ask. Oh, there he is. He's given the 50 out. The madman. 50 memberships. Wow. So let's see who gets one. That is pretty amazing. All right. Well, ladies and gentlemen, um, remember that... Uh, I announced the winners of the competition earlier on, so they're on my channel now. I've uploaded them. Uh, remember to, to drop into the comments, and if the winners are down there, just tell them well done or whatever, you know, that'll be good. Um, the other thing, um, yeah, poor old Fry Liver, poor old Fry Liver hasn't been given one. He's been begging for a membership for ages. Uh, I will also um, remind people uh of the fact that the merit merit pure merit such merit that is actually working at the moment uh until the jordan peterson stream happens i was going to do it tonight but i did the stuart lee one instead stuart lee has been taken off uh air by the bbc he's been taken off youtube um that stream i did i'm going to try to put it back up uh and see if i can get it past uh the copyright if it doesn't appear, you'll know I failed. If it does, you know I've succeeded. All right. Thank you very much. Most importantly of all, ladies and gentlemen, get out. What goes on in this town is none of your business. As long as I'm living here, it is. Then maybe you shouldn't be living here!